start off with, you know, you just tell me who you are. And, yeah. Yeah. Well, my name is Gilbert Alistair Gray, and I was born on the 13th of September 1924. So I'm now approaching the ripe old age of 99. <laughs> <laughs> and you were born where? I was born in Dundee, uh, Upper Constitution Street, <laughs> I'm told. And uh, very quickly, uh, there were lots of photographers in, in my family, and particularly my father, who was in the uh, pub, the, as a newspaper reporter and cameraman. He obviously had taken a photograph of me uh, when I was about uh, maybe three months old, because I had been transported in his sidecar with my mother to see my grandmother who lived in the tiny hamlet of Clashmore which is just west of uh, Dornoch and is on the Skibo estate and of course uh, many of my or several of my family actually worked for Andrew Carnegie on, on the estate and in some ways the uh, name of our Andrew Carnegie crops up quite a bit during the man's lifetime. <laughs> Indeed, my two sisters <clears throat> now themselves live and have lived in Dornoch for many years and are, have been a, closely associated with life in, in, in Dornoch, one of them being a, an infant mistress the other being a very musical and for some time organist in the Dornach Cathedral. Mm. Mm. So from Dundee, where did you go after that? Dundee, uh, after my first sister was born, we obviously moved down to the Dunferman area. And he, my father was appointed the district representative for uh, John Lang Company and with the People's Journal and Courier. And first of all, it seems we lived for a short time in Rosyth, but uh, soon moved up into Dunfermline itself, which is only a few miles away in the days of a tram car. <laughs> and uh, until I was about 11 perhaps we stayed in Dunfermline and uh, later on moved out to uh, three or so miles away to the village of Crossford and this of course we're talking about Crossford Fife not Crossford so. Okay so did you go to school in Crossford? Oh yes there were I started school, of course, in Dunfermline as uh, in infants and as uh, when I was uh, 10, perhaps, we had moved to uh, the Crossford and I attended the Crossford and Kearney Hill School. I was there only there for about a year before going on to secondary, but it uh, was actually joint ducks at <laughs> that time. <laughs> it's quite a small school. So then I went to Dunfermline High School and went uh, through all the, up to, right through to sixth year. Uh, when I had just moved into the senior school in 1939, the, the war started and of course school closed. Uh, in anticipation of a, a blitzkrieg. In the meantime, many of the families were busy sticking sticky tape on windows to prevent them shattering in, in the bomb attack or, or digging holes in their garden to build air raid shelters. And still nothing happened. <laughs> nothing happened. Even in, on some areas of flat ground, there appeared lots of telephone, what looked like telephone poles. 
but these were designed to prevent the German paratroops from, from landing. Uh, I remember one area, particularly near Kincardine at the time. Anyway, how far had I got there now? Um, no, you're, you're at school in Dunfermline, uh, and you, you, oh it yes, stopped uh, at the, the fifth year. Uh, or fourth the war year. started, school closed, but uh, after nothing happening, uh, school reopened, and I think it would be October of the year. And uh, on that very first day, I was walking home to Cross Ford, a distance of about three miles or so. Uh, no buses, it's either cycle or walk. <laughs> and uh, we were walking by, and uh, just outside Pittencreef Park, we heard this rattling, strange noises in the sky. Unusual. And uh, we couldn't see anything, but we later discovered that this was the first raid made by the German Air Force on Britain. Mm -hmm. uh, some ships of the fleet, we had an enormous fleet of course in those days, we had been lying at anchor. And some German Heinkels and Dorniers had come over and attacked and caused some damage. I think a few few sailors were killed actually, but on the other hand, the 617 squad, not 617, 601 squadron, 602 and 603, which were Spitfire mm -hmm. and Gladiator fighters in those days, shot down several of the, the German planes, which skedaddled back home again. <laughs> So that was really the start of hostilities and thereafter, all during the war, we had sporadic air raid warnings. In our particular area, nothing very particular happened. Uh, we were under the, the flight path of the German attack on Clyde Bank for a couple of nights mm -hmm. and the, the, I remember the sound of the strange sound of the German uh, engine, aero engines. And there was, in fact, when I, I was about to set off for my chemistry examination in, in school, getting in my bike out of the garden shed, the air raid siren warned us of something, but then it was quite a number of false warnings in those days. Well, I might have said that uh, well, no, before, uh, then I left school, of course, in my sixth year and looked for uh, work and knowing that I would be called up and at the age of 18 and a half. And I had uh, some employment with the post office delivering Christmas parcels and all that sort of thing. And... Uh, uh, my memory is now slipping away, I'm afraid. You were saying there about getting your bike to go for the geography exam and there was a... Uh, that's right. But was that, did you say that, that there was a bomb dropped near no, you? No, oh, that, that was... Uh, we had, there were spasmodic attacks of maybe what seemed to be just single aircraft coming and there were the odd bombs. In fact, there was a stick of bombs of about ten bombs dropped uh, parallel to the main street of the village of Cross Ford. It was, uh, that's the sort of thing, very random. Maybe the, the, they were, the navigation wasn't very good or they were looking for Rosyth, which was as a crow, crow flies only a few miles away from us, you see. So there I, I one of the jobs that I took on was to join the Royal Observer Corps, which had a, 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 a centre in Dunfermline. Dunfermline, of course, at the time was famous for its silk and, and cotton mills. And this, the base was in one of the silk mills. And uh, the, the, the crew that I joined were la uh, largely old soldiers and there was lots of banter and so on, but we, we plotted aircraft coming in from the the observation points 
around the county and we plotted as you know you've seen the Battle of Britain displays on the table we had a table like that and plotted the things but we weren't we were sel seldom travelled in that part of the world although uh, at that time there were lots of very serious attacks on the seaside or the coastal towns Aberdeen in particular mm. had a very serious attack and I've had to seem to remember that one of the hindcalls actually crashed on the ice rink in, in Aberdeen. Mm. And so it went on and uh, time then came, my time came at uh, 18 and a half. So after leaving school, what did you do? After leaving school, well, I've, uh, as I say, I, I was in the Royal Observer Corps, but the time came at 18 and a half. I was called up, I got a message from King George <laughs> to come and come and join, come and join us. And it so happened my cousin who was in the Air Force well, happened to be on leave and was leaving to return to his unit the day I was uh, sent down to London. I was sent down, I, I had of course been through various tests before this. Uh, physical tests and, and intelligent tests and all the rest of it and uh, I was deemed okay for air crew and uh, when I was called I was I had to it was a case of volunteering this wasn't a, well, it was a call up but it was really also volunteering for air crew and I was offered uh, entry to either as an air gunner or as a flight engineer. And I chose, fortunately, I think, flight engineer. And uh, to join air crew, one was uh, sent down to London, to Lord's Cricket Ground, actually, which was the air crew recruiting centre. And there, there one got all the jags, which remind me I've had one this morning. <laughs> um, uh, all the jags and... It was interesting to see the response of so many of my new cronies, often many of them actually fainting and falling apart. <laughs> uh -huh. And uh, we were billeted in London, in, I remember, Eight Halls Road, Eight Hall Road, uh, in Marlborough, Marlborough, I think it was. And from there we were taken to be fitted out with uniform, and boots, which had to be tackety because they wanted a nice, when you were marching, a nice clip, clop, clip, clop, clop. And in the Air Force, I think it was 140 to the minute, marching pretty smart. And it was March time, and that spring was uh, rather warm down there, and we still had to wear great coats. You can imagine <laughs> what it was, was like prowling about the seats of London and being taken to the swimming baths. I remember being uh, uh, shown how to uh, uh, upright a, a dinghy in the water, giving us upside down. We had to put it up. It's a pretty tricky, pretty tricky job. Things like that. And that lasted a few weeks. And then one was sent to what were called initial training wings. And indeed, when I was uh, in the, I had, I don't know if I mentioned that I had joined the, the air training corps at school, and of course our teachers, uh, were our uh, officers, and we learned the, the rudiments of well, <laughs> marching, trying to get rid of two left feet, <laughs> for some people. <laughs> Uh, and uh, in introduction to meteorology, for example, or uh, uh, navigation and that sort of thing. So I had a smattering of all this before joining up. So we went, we were sent first of all to an initial training wing, where again we learned weapon training and that sort of thing. I can remember one day putting six shots through one hole in the target, which is a surprise. Whether I missed with five, I don't know, but, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
but uh, yes, that was the sort of thing, crawling about on the moors of uh, eastern Yorkshire, then Bridlington. The next stage was to begin engineer training and from there we were sent down to South Wales to St Athan, which was a, a very large establishment that was a, a, a PE school, a physical engineering, a physical education school as well. And it was very well equipped with all sorts of sport activities and so on. Uh, during the day we could be getting tuition and all the ins and outs of different kinds of bolts and screws and all the rest of it. And at the night uh, we were going, could play badminton in this, in this area. We also had, it had a fine concert hall and we had several visits from the BBC orchestra with some of the fine soloists of the day. Maggie Tate, I remember, was one. Uh, and so it went on. And the, having gone through the preliminaries, we were then switched into a training on a particular aircraft. And I was fortunate enough to be sent to the Lancaster group. Mm -hmm. And we trained on Lancaster and learned all the ins and outs of the fuselage and all the workings of the machine. And we were sent to the, the factory in, in Manchester, which is now Manchester Airport sent in there for a week and we lived in Sivy Diggs and received more instruction there. Mm. So what was the main role of a flight engineer? What did you do when you were actually on, on a mission? Well, the, the, the how shall I put it, um, in the engineer's handbook we are described as the not only flight engineer, but pilot's assistant. Now, I don't think too many realise that, but it meant also training to fly. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry, I must come back to the question, I'm sorry. Just about the role of the oh, flight the role, engineer. Yes. Well, as pilot's assistant, so and we were seven of a crew, eventually, not quite yet, but uh, w there was a stage where we learned to fly in a, a little machine which replicated all the movements and controls and so on. And that was in addition to our normal engineer duties. And uh, all this continued through until it was uh, Christmas 1943. We actually passed out. Uh, the group of us marched past, you see, and we had just received our stripes, sergeant stripes. The, the white uh, insets to our caps had to be, as cadets, they were dispensed with. And we marched past to the salute. And there we were, the RAF ensign. And where was the military band? No band. <laughs> A scratchy old gramophone record playing the RAF march past. <laughs> and so we passed out. We were now not LACs anymore. We were fully sergeant. And of course, for all this business of taking all things up and getting things sewn on and whatnot. And that was just about Christmas time in 1943. And we were then posted uh, posted to Scampton. Now Scampton is a famous aerodrome because that's where 617 mm -hmm. Squadron, the Dambusters, flew from on their attack. But at that time, they were, the, the squadron wasn't there because they were relaying the rail run runways, converting from grass to tarmac. And it was Christmas time, and uh, it so happened, oh, it was very cold, and it had been snow, and we spent our, it was almost a gymnastic exercise, we were doing cross-country runs in, in the snow in the surrounding area. But there was really nothing that could be done, and we were sent on leave. 
So I was home for Christmas in 1943. Having arrived at uh, Scampton, we were held there for a little while. In fact, as I say, we were sent on leave. And we returned to join what was called an operational training unit, where we, as fl uh, flight engineers, uh, mingled with crews who had been flying on four, two engine aircraft and were now to convert to four engine aircraft and they required an engineer. Uh, so I teamed up with a, one particular crew, I, I can't remember the name of the pilot, but it doesn't matter. I flew with them once or twice and I was terribly airsick. And so I was taken off flying and given medication and so on and then joined another crew. It so happened that the first crew I was with had disappeared. They had gone on to a squadron and they had disappeared. But this new crew consisted of a pilot of about 23, who was a jeweler, navigator, a Canadian, navigator, another Canadian bomb aimer, a bit of a gunner who was the oldest, we were all, well, when I was only 19, wasn't I? But the pilot was about 23 or something like that, but the bit of a gunner was the oldest of the, of the group. He was in his mid-30s, I think, if I remember rightly and a rear gunner, an Englishman, who was an upholsterer, <laughs> and myself uh, as a crookie flight engineer. And we, we just seemed to melt, and we stayed together for the rest of the time. So we did our training together, uh, getting, we, I forget the we joined over, but our training was on the Stirling bomber, which was the first of the big heavy bombers. Uh, beautiful, wonderful in the air, but it had drawbacks in that its bomb base didn't suit the new uh, bombs that were being created. They had rather narrow bomb base, uh, quite long. And uh, it was very high, it had an electrical undercarriage, uh, which would some time break down and it had to be wound down. It took about 20 minutes to wind down these wheels. Uh, but that was the aircraft we, we flew on to begin with. And we did uh, something like 18 different exercises, like uh, circuits and bumps, of course, mm -hmm. and uh, short course crunches, bombing, uh, bomb and training over the wash. The main target area was at the, at the wash. And uh, that lasted for quite a while, it uh, lasted several months. And then uh, when that was completed, we were posted to what was called a, a line finishing school. When we converted, oh, by this time, uh, this, I remember now, Halfway through that uh, exercise, Lancaster disappeared. Mm -hmm. And I can remember the first Lancaster that landed in this uh, uh, conversion unit and out stepped a young lady. You flew on in, flew on in the Lancaster. And this was the start of our uh, uh, acquaintance with this Lancaster. So we continued that training until we, got, we completed the course, all sorts of long cross countries, night flying and day flying and fighter affiliation. A fighter would be sent up to, to play with us, as it were, mm. and give the gunners practice. And the next stage, we were nearly there. We were sent to Lang Finishing School, where we were introduced to operational flying and we were taken up 
by an experienced uh, instructor and shown what the Lancaster could do. And I can remember <laughs> almost leaving a wash uh, over uh, Skegness, that area, sort of lifting over the the pier and so on. It was really a bit scary <laughs> at times, but it just showed you what the Lancaster could do. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was really quite short. And then came the post into a squadron. Now, uh, the squadron we were sent to was 106. Now, I didn't know at the time, but one learned to learn through research and so on, that actually 106 Squadron was a kind of offshoot of 617, which had been in the dams right before. In fact, uh, uh, the, wing, the wing, wing commander of 617 had been taken from 106. And many of the participants in the part of the, that famous raid had come from 106. So we were in pretty good company. And so we did a few... Uh, there was one aircraft in particular on this game, JB1663. ZN was the squadron letter, ZN A able. Again, a famous aircraft where it went right through the war and was eventually broken up after it had done about a hundred and something operations. Well, that was the first aircraft that we flew. We were in, uh, but then no, we had done a, we flew our first trip there. And uh, indeed, we had a little bit short training period with the squadron procedures yeah. and we were sent over to Coningsby as a crew to pick up a brand new Lancaster one of the Canadian built ones we used to, used to like there were two kinds of propellers we used to see there's the one with a point pointed tips the others were rounded tips which we felt were much more powerful and this was the kind that we brought back to the squadron and it so happened that was one, and the aircraft, which was the ZN with squadron letters, the ZN Charlie, C Charlie, it was, became our particular aircraft. LL953 was its re registration number. <laughs> so uh, off we went eventually in the, the old aircraft on our first trip. And uh, we were went through the briefing. The target was to be in the middle of France, a big ammunition dump, now of course run by the Germans. And uh, 12 of us were detailed. But uh, again, from my researches, actually there were other aircraft from other squadrons there as well. I think in total was about 57 on this attack. And, uh, well, the details are in my logbook there in time of takeoff. Anyway, we, we flew along, uh, we took off at dusk, uh, and uh, just went headed for the target, and we didn't see any other aircraft apart from our own squadron. And, of course, darkness fell, and you, we, we flew along in absolute darkness, uh, although there were 57 aircraft, we didn't see another soul until and we were quite near the target. And uh, I suddenly spotted, because I'm, I'm up front beside the pilot, I spotted what was like a little, one of those little sparklers. And it was only, to me, uh, it was only one thing. And that was a, a combat of some kind, an exchange of fire. So my words were, I can remember them now, uh, uh, combat, starboard brow up, and of course that was designed to get everybody on the lookout. 
after that you just had to be everybody was looking for trouble <laughs> but we eventually got to the target and as I learned uh, after well, I, I, I published a book I don't know if you know <laughs> I wrote a book and uh, uh, people obviously bought this book including the man who actually marked the target uh, the, uh, my book is called Green Markers Ahead. The, it had been this man who was the navigator of the mosquito b b b bomber that had gone in and marked the target with a, with the green target. Hence the book Green Markers Ahead. <laughs> and so we we went in and went through the target again, not did what we had to do, and turned and came back, not knowing that on the route four of our squadron aircraft had been shot down, mm. and only one survivor from the, the four crews, 28 men in one go, mm. and we got home safely. and. Uh, then you, you land, you go through the motions. Our station number uh, or uh, code, code sign was coffee stall. You call up your area, hello coffee stall, hello coffee stall. Uh, see Charlie, well, in this case it was a able, able was wished to land. You do your downwind course, crosswind, upwind, and then in and come and land. Our aerodrome at Metheringham had FIDO pipes fitted on each side of the runway. Now these were pipes which were perforated and in a, on a foggy night they would pump petrol and, and this great fire would start to clear the mist, you see. Now, where are the, where are the FIDO pipes? Fog intensive dispersal of <laughs> Fido. <laughs> but if we had the, the pipes, but they weren't there. <laughs> We'd landed at the wrong aerodrome. <laughs> because there were so many aerodromes around Lincoln at that time. It was very easy, Waddington and Fiskerton and all the rest of it. So a quick, quick turn around, off, up, up, and in. Called the called coffee stall, and we finally landed, and that was our first stop. Yes, the, eventually we accomplished thirty-four of these missions. One or two stand out. Uh, I've already mentioned the first one. June the sixth, of course, D Day uh, was another one. Uh, of course, before each mission, there was a briefing section, but invasion was never mentioned. Oh, it was to be just a straightforward uh, mission. And so we went and we, we dropped. Uh, we, we bombed at five o'clock in the morning, near enough five o'clock. But as we were, just after we had dropped our bombs, I think it was the, the tonnage would be about five and a half tons if it be carried. And then we spotted on the horizon four German fighters. Now, from my reading, I understand that very few German fighters were in, in the air that morning. But we saw four of them, Fokker Wolves, and of course they were heading our way. And uh, got close enough to fire and could see the, the red shots going over the wings and this sort of thing. And um, my rear gunner was saying, get into the cloud. We had actually been told not to go below the clouds because of all the activity below. But in fact, Wally shouted, get into the cloud, get into the cloud. So into the cloud we went and we got away. But. I've been reading since, I found an article 
in a magazine fairly recently of another crew who must have been right beside us who were shot down at the time we were in there. It must have, it was, in fact, it was an interview with one of the pilots who had actually done the shooting down, the German pilots. So we escaped by the skin of our teeth <laughs> and, and, and we got back home. But it was obvious, although we'd been told nothing special, it was obvious that there was something on the go because as we flew south, I could remember fly on various aerodromes and so on, passed over. All the aircraft had black and white stripes uh, painted on their wings and fuselage. And of course this had been done more or less overnight to distinguish all the fighters and gliders and other squadrons uh, for this particular event. And we got, we hadn't been told it was an invasion, nothing special, but we got back and we found out. Mm. So that that was a, again a, a pretty scary do, uh, but it happened what ten seconds and it was <laughs> it was over. Mm. So that that was one. Uh, on another occasion, uh, the bomber command effort was on railways, a lot of forming of railways at that time. Uh, in fact, it was actually the, the beginning of the build-up for the invasion, mm -hmm. cutting off Normandy from elsewhere. And on this occasion, uh, ten of us, there was a quite, a, quite a big raid, but ten of us from 106 were detailed to attack a railway line. Uh, uh, in the Orléans area, the, uh, the, the railway yards were attacked in Orléans, but we were sent to do another job from very low level to bomb the railway itself. So ten of us went out. The first one would find the target, drop the bombs, and then drop a flare, and the next one would come in and <laughs> bomb the flare. And we, we, we tore it up, we think, for about 30 miles or something like that. And that was an interesting interesting mm. one. It was that the sort of thing that 617 would be asked to do. Uh, in our 34 tax, uh, tax, some of course were very straightforward, but one or two stand out in their mind. For example, in France, the Maquis, were very active. The, uh, uh, to worry the Germans. And they were very active in the Lyon area. And we, we took off to attack this place called Givor. Now, we took off in a thunderstorm and pouring rain. And we flew there and back in thunderstorms with the St. Elmo's fire uh, dancing up and down between the guns and so on, that sort of thing. Another one which stands in the mind was when we were at the attacking uh, industry in Stuttgart, which had been very difficult, I believe, to find uh, previously, but there were two very Within two nights, we visited Stuttgart twice, attacking industry. Um, and the first one, very quiet, no, anti but very heavy anti-aircraft fire. The second time, uh, two nights later, we attacked again. And my av navigator was very keen to see this anti-aircraft fire, but there was none about. And we were walking about 12, 15,000 feet, and all of a sudden, no, the guns are not firing because the fighters are about. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, we were attacked, and our aircraft was riddled. Uh, within a yard of us, the whole of the, uh, the fuselage was riddled, and as we were finally thought we were going to struggle home anyway, come what may, 
and as it got a little brighter, all sorts of jagged things on the wings. Just cannon fire had damaged us a bit, but uh, we managed to get get back. And that, that was one of the times when the pilot let me fly the thing. <laughs> he, you know, pretty strenuous. Uh, all the, uh, that what we that would be an eight-hour trip, probably something like that. And he used to let me up and take over for a, a wee while because the l -San was at the far end, <laughs> at the far end of the aircraft. Uh, so, yes, it was quite varied. The last one uh, in August, the very last one, was totally different because by that time the Americans had more or less chased the Germans out of the west of France so there's, there was, on that particular day, there was no opposition at all. So uh, it was a small group of, of us, I think only about 10 aircraft, some from 617 and, and some of us. And uh, I buy a particular aircraft and it, uh, I think four, four of us were sent ahead of the main force on a glorious autumn day, beautiful looking down on the French coast. We were sent ahead to calculate the winds because the direction and so strength affected the flight of the, of the bombs. The aircraft behind, some 617, were attacking the U-boat uh, bases. But it was a pretty fruitless exercise because of the concrete. <laughs> Uh, and I know now that, it, it, in fact, the target is now a, a Lido, actually, an advertised the holiday centre. But then we recalculate the winds, which is the navigators can, can do, and they, we joined the main force and dropped special bombs, uh, armour-piercing, long 2,000-pounders, and beautiful to look at, but pretty deadly. But I, I don't think we did very much damage through the, the, the concrete, anyway. That's just a taste of some of the things we had to do. OK, and in recent years you were awarded a, a medal by the French government? Oh, yes, that was uh, quite recently, actually, quite recently. Um, it was the time when the beginning of the celebrations, you had a period of lots of celebrations. And I think it would be about five years ago, the president of France wanted to reward all those who had helped in the liberation of France. And some of us could list, in fact, a list of things that happened here. Just we had to supply instances of our, what we had done to help and uh, I qualified for this honour mm -hmm. uh, as, as many, many others. In fact, we had a, a, an investiture in Glasgow in the, uh, count, the city buildings and uh, with the French consul presenting the, the medals and so on, which is I suppose uh, quite an honour, really, because it, it is, I think, reputed to be the France's highest honour, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Uh, so there we are. Okay. Now came De, De Mob, of course, uh, but before De Mob, uh, and after I had completed my uh, uh, tour of operations and the war had finished, I was sent to Italy and uh, remastered and uh, was involved in clerical work in clearing up uh, all the, the munitions and so on that uh, lay in the Far East. And uh, that lasted a year. And uh, I returned home and eventually demobbed in the middle of 1947. What to do? I decided to go for teaching go to university and I chose a degree, an honours degree in geography. So I went to Edinburgh University in the company of a lot of other ex-service men 
who had decided to do similar things. But eventually, uh, having studied not only geography, but meteorology, geology, and so on, I graduated and uh, decided to go for teaching. Went through my training at Murray House. In fact, it was there, on one occasion, we were called to the assembly hall in Murray House to be, told that the king, to be told that the king had died. And that was the beginning of Elizabeth's reign, the long reign. Having a, my first job in teaching was in a, a nice little junior secondary school in Rosyth. Uh, teaching youngsters up to the age of 15, which was a, a delightful experience. But uh, one that always wanted to ad advance, so seeking more experience, I, uh, I moved to Aberdeen and taught in Aberdeen Academy for several years. Uh, mainly a girls' school, but slowly converting, the, the balance was beginning to change to being a co-educational school. Uh, a, a very good school, actually, in Belmont Street. But uh, ambition again takes hold. One reads the newspaper for uh, adverts, and there is uh, a post going in in uh, Lanark, which is a long way away. By this time we had a wee girl in the family, but uh, I applied for this post in Lanark, which was the principal teacher of geography, which, I, which came my way. I discovered, of course, that there was no geography department because it had been under the aegis of the English department. So I, I began my work as a building up a geography department in uh, Lanark. And uh, after a number of years, uh, apparently I had been doing some interesting work and yes, it, Jews had spread to Jordan Hill College and two gentlemen, an inspector and a head of department came down to see me to invite me up to Jordan Hill. And I thought long and hard about going to the college because I was quite happy. Uh, and unfortunately, we had changed headmasters and the new man, uh, put it abroad, it was not to my liking. And so eventually I decided to go. Uh, by that time, of course, I was well ensconced into geography as a member of various committees and, and that sort of thing in the county. And indeed nationally, I had been uh, appointed, a, a, first of all, a, as a marker of examination papers and I then become a setter and a full examiner uh, in addition to my teaching work. But uh, again, but, uh, having gone to Jordan Hill, I found that I was in a t totally different atmosphere from my school and didn't really like it all that much. However, there came uh, an advertisement for advisor in geography in Lanark Division, as Strathclyde was then in the Lanark Division, which had about 36 secondary schools, something like that. And I was persuaded, although I'd only been a year in Jordan Hill, that I, would, I had to go for it. I had to go for it. Unfortunately, I was appointed. So I spent a, you know, quite a few years as, uh, as advisor. And, and that brought me, of course, into contact with all sorts of other 
other bodies and I, I, seem, I seem to have become the world's experts in environmental education although to me it was perfectly good geography but others were seeing it in a different way and I even had a, a request from south of the border um, to prepare or to offer to them for a, a European exhibition or, or conference on environmental occasion in Georgia, Tbilisi. <laughs> and I had to prepare a, a script, of course, and I had a good collection of my own slides, which I built up into them at a presentation, thinking, of course, I, this is a good, could be a good trip. <laughs> Unfortunately, it was what the inspector it took over and took my stuff to Georgia. Things like that were happening, mm -hmm. and I seem to have made a name for myself in that, that particular field. But to me, it was just geography, good geography, and the kids were enjoying it and so on. And then, of course, I had been, my, I was, in, of course, as an advisor in the company of uh, advisors in other subjects uh, and uh, been there a long time. They were all a bit younger than I was because I had been at the war. And, <laughs> and uh, eventually a post came up and they were, they were these lads, young lads were uh, uh, applying for a headmastership in that instant grammar. And I thought, these lads are applying. I'll have a go. Well, lo and behold, <laughs> I landed up at the Amistad Grammar School and was there until I retired. Okay, but you didn't want to live in Addingston, oh, ideally. Yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, moving into Addingston brought some problems because some of the local hooligans began to uh, do damage to my property. My son's motorbike landed up in the Clyde. Uh, my own garden gates disappeared, things like that. So we felt for the family's sake and my wife's sake, look, we should really move somewhere. So we explored and among the villages round about and it so happened we hopped, like, were up Straven Way and we came through Glassford and uh, never heard of Glassford before. And there on the corner of a street was a man standing and as we passed, he waved his hands. And uh, we thought, oh, this looks like a nice friendly place. And so eventually we did last up in Glassford. And we discovered that this gentleman was in the habit of standing on the corner of the street waving at everybody who had passed. <laughs> and that's how we landed up in, 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 in Glassford, which at that time had at least three shops and a post office, but now has nothing. <laughs> so that's our stay in Glassford. And we've been now here for 40 years. Mm. So you've been 40 years in, in Glasgow? 40 years, yes. And the time has flown, mm -hmm. flown. When we came to the village, of course, we were involved in setting up a, a home and busy creating a, a garden and, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing, as, as one does. And I've always been involved uh, in other activities. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been very heavily involved in the church, uh, right to the highest level. In fact, I was once invited to be moderator of the Congregational Union of Scotland, Sorry. now, now the defunct. And so I, we looked for a church and visited a number of churches round about. Uh, I, I, to be honest, we we found it. We didn't find sufficient activity, 
in the, in the area, which has now, of course, proved to be quite wrong. Mm -hmm. But we finally settled in the village and uh, joined the, the local church uh, as regular attenders. Strictly speaking, we're, we're not members, we are adherents mm -hmm. nowadays, having been formerly a congregational in church. But uh, we, my wife got uh, quite quickly involved. Uh, every Thursday night, uh, there was a, my wife was a very good embroiderer and needleworker and uh, quickly gathered a group of ladies who met in the house here every Thursday night mm -hmm. for a long, long time until she wasn't fit to do it anymore. For myself, uh, I suppose I was looking at uh, church activities and uh, I didn't find, how shall I put it, uh, anything that really suited. But uh, I liked to get involved in local affairs and so the village at that time had its own um, community council and so I joined that and quickly became a secretary mm -hmm. uh, for a while and until of course uh, matters changed and there is now no community council. But sadly uh, I'd have, I've developed uh, serious trouble in my the lower part of my body, which now restricts me very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I'm no longer able, uh, even in, we developed the garden, of course, which is rather nice and is now under junior management with my daughters coming to live with me. But uh, uh, even trying, I joined the Probus Club mm -hmm. for a while. But of course, my my disability prevents that any anymore, mm -hmm. uh, which I used to enjoy. It, and uh, I was fortunate enough to have friends who would pick me up and take me down to the meetings. But I haven't been able to attend for quite some time now. Mm -hmm. So now I'm more or less, unless I'm taken out for a trip into the fresh air, largely confined to home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Although um, uh, I, when I retired I did a lot of writing. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of writing. I wrote a book which was published of my wartime experiences. I spent a long time creating an illustrated family tree mm -hmm. in which I was able to trace ancestry back to the 17, late 1700s. Um, much, much of it uh, related to my ancestry in, in the north of Scotland, mm -hmm. very much uh, a, a product of, of the crofting community. <laughs> oh, right, right. So Highland based. Uh, yes, it's in my blood and of course my, my father uh, retired and moved away f from their, their home in Dunfermline uh, and moved to Dorda, which is uh, 250 miles away. Mm -hmm. And so, because he was in, in the First World War, he was a piper, he was winning prizes for piping when he was 11. Mm -hmm. His father was a piper before him, a pipe major, had served in the Black Watch in Egypt. And so, I didn't, because of circumstances, of our, my own movement here and his uh, event on retirement, moving to Dornoch, so far away. And although there, and I started gathering as much information as I could mm -hmm. about him because there are letters which he wrote to his his uh, eventual wife in, in Dornoch when he was uh, obviously in 1915, mm -hmm. 16, 17. Uh, and he himself was a pipe major. In fact, I, I often think of him putting a stop 
to the the World War One mm-hmm. because uh, Armistice was in November nineteen eighteen. Mm-hmm. But he was still in on the continent in the army of occupation, and he was a pipe major himself, mm-hmm. in at various times with different Highland regiments. But in July 1919, Juillet 14, mm-hmm. French uh, day, there was arranged a victory march of all the Allies in Paris. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there were contingents from all the countries that had helped us during the war. And of course he himself had been with a number of the Scottish regiments. And uh, a great victory march took part that day. Mm-hmm. And it was led, the British contingent was led by this mass band of the Highland Piping Regiment. Mm-hmm. And he was pipe major of it. <laughs> so he, led, he basically led the parade. He led the parade. Mm-hmm. And there's a letter written from to his mother from the YMCA in Paris. Mm-hmm. And there's, I remember the words, says, and me in charge of it all. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> lovely. Yeah. Uh-huh. So tell me a bit about the Glassford Community Group. What, what did it get involved in in the village? Well... Small, small things like rights of way. Well, the first thing I did was uh, uh, to check the rights of way, mm-hmm. and uh, they were neglected, and so uh, I arranged and brought to the notice of the council, of course, and uh, the 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 rights of way were preserved. And for example, on the the way up to the the farm mm-hmm. here. Uh, a new style was provided mm-hmm. and a new rate we drowned and that well, sort of thing. Re- leading up to Newton. Uh, 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 Hanks over to Newton and up. Uh, 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 in fact, uh, I remember reading in, in the Echoes that someone had found the the sign leading up yes. to the heads. Yeah, that was Mark, uh, that's right. Mark Brown. Well, I found that years ago uh-huh. and had it replaced years ago right. and it's obviously come to grief yeah. since then as well. I don't know when it came off, uh, but Mark found it in the field. Oh, well, it was lying, in, I found it lying in the field beside right. the so I had that replaced. Uh-huh. Little little things like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. All, all good for the village. Though. Aye, aye. Yeah. But, uh, oh, we were very much involved with the senior citizens, of course. Had a, a great uh, company there. And mm-hmm. had lots of uh, trips, annual trips and various things like that. Mm-hmm. And we, we, we got involved. And <laughs> I remember the very first thing that we got involved in in the village. Uh, um, do you remember the gentleman who was so badly burnt? Uh, yes, Kenny. Kenny. Yeah. Kenny, the the first thing we encountered here was Kenny had arranged a, a, just a walk mm-hmm. for raising money for the hospital. Mm-hmm. And we thought, well, we, we thought this would be a good chance to meet people in the village. Mm-hmm. So we joined this thing. But some, most people thought it was a a marathon were on, and they went sc- scooting away, f- left us far behind. Mm-hmm. And s- but we followed the course right, right round, and got back looking for the, the what well, tea would be served in the hall. Mm-hmm. See, but by the time we got back here, everybody had disappeared. <laughs> so our our plan to meet the villagers didn't really work out <laughs> didn't come off. well. <laughs> But, uh, yes, things like that. Mm-hmm. And you've enjoyed your time in Glassford? Yes, yes. Uh, I'm just disappointed that the disappearance of the services that mm-hmm. were available when we came mm-hmm. have now gone, mm-hmm. although you're, you're trying hard to yeah. make, make things better. Trying to do something with the village hall. Oh, oh yes. Oh, there was hall. You know, you go up and you have a game of badminton or mm-hmm. table tennis or something like that. And there were always social events, mm-hmm. yeah. but uh, it died a bit, and I just feel, again, having attended the school, mm-hmm. and uh, 
I like to try and help the school as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, attending the open day, mm -hmm. I just felt, look, this is not my village anymore. Mm -hmm. Because people, all the old folks are gone, new people are in uh, with, the, with their own interests, their own companies and so on. Mm -hmm. And at uh, our age now, we're not about able to get about so much mm -hmm. and mingle. And it's a bit disappointing in that way. But then I know that you're trying hard to yeah, put well, things hopefully, right. Yeah, hopefully we can do something with the village to bring yeah. some services back. Yes. It ba badly needs a, a focus of some kind. Uh -huh. and, and of course, a lot of the things that are being arranged in the, in the musical field and, and that uh -huh. sort of thing are really not my scene. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'm still old fashioned. Uh, uh, the whole whole of society has changed mm -hmm. uh, uh, now, and uh, even television is changing and uh, has moved away from my yeah in, into a new era altogether. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Which is not to say I annoyed or anything like that, but it's just life. It's <laughs> different. It's yes, different. it's just life. Yeah. Uh -huh.